economics editor at The Times, uh, and I'll be joined on the stage by Chris Sear, who's just had his introduction, um, uh, chairman of the Institutional uh, Disclosures Working Group, um, as you heard, and Piers Lawson, who's um, a director in the clients department at Bailey Gifford, and he, he's also a member of the Institutional Disclosure Working Group. Um, so both of them have a lot to say about uh, value uh, for money in uh, investment fees. Um, uh, so this, this session really could hardly have been more timely or more topical. We've, uh, we've had the introduction of MIFID II in January, so transparency is uh, top of the agenda uh, in the investment industry. Um, so the ambition really is to recover some of the sort of reputational uh, damage, to repair some of the reputational damage that has been done and recover some of the trust that's been lost um, due to concerns about hidden fees. I mean, that, that, that's, that's clearly a, a, a major goal of uh, MIFID II and, and what's, what Chris and others are doing. Um, so we will be talking about ensuring value for money in investment management fees. And the session will be live streamed, so welcome to our online audience. Um, you can submit questions to uh, uh, online and uh, we will be picking up questions here from you in the audience. It can be done over the app or we can go the old-fashioned way with raising your hand as well. Um, so uh, really, I ought to introduce uh, my panellists um, properly. There's, uh, so we've got Piers Lawson. So I should be standing over here, actually. Chris, if you uh, want to go, go, to go, over, uh, go over to the lectern, yeah. Uh, Piers is a director in the uh, clients department at Bailey Gifford. Uh, he's been at Bailey Gifford for 10 years, and uh, he's been involved in the transparency agenda for the past three, really thanks to Bailey Gifford's role as one of the largest managers to the local government pen pension scheme assets. Um, uh, and uh, he's also obviously a member of the FCA's Institutional Disclosure Working Group. Chris doesn't need an awful lot of introduction for uh, the people in the audience here, I, I presume. A former cop uh, who used to be on the beat here in Edinburgh. The beat stopped at the end of the grass market just across the road. So. <laughs> there you go. Um, a black belt in judo. Um, he made an unusual career move of joining UBS Warburgs after that in the derivatives department, then went on to develop the transparency code for the local government pension scheme. Um, which obviously Bailey Gifford has uh, with, got the connection with. It was, it was that work and his no-nonsense approach uh, that led to his appointment by the FSCA as chairman of uh, the Institutional Disclosure Working Group, it is a mouthful, uh, where he is spearheading you know, attempts to, uh, to, improve, uh, to improve standards. Um, so let me hand over to Chris, who's going to lead us off with a presentation on where the uh, IW, uh, uh, IDWG is, uh, is at. Works after a while. Yeah. You get used to saying it. So I recognise that, that pretty much what I'm saying and, and the, the short panel afterwards is preventing you from getting to the bar that about half the audience went for um, at the end of the last session. So thank you to the sponsors who put the free bar on downstairs. I want to know why it wasn't in here because that'll be much more interesting. Um, so yeah, I've, I've been doing this for a long time now and I've spoken to a few about a few of these sessions. Uh, and right now I have something more substantive to talk about rather than just trying to push an agenda of transparency, we actually have something tangible to hang our hat off. So what I'm going to talk about is um, a couple of slides which are more nebulous than the why. Um, I don't think many of the whys uh, need too much explaining. And then I'm going to go into something more technical, which is how we're working, what our design principles are, what the pyramid is that we're using to design uh, the framework for cost collection, which many of you will either use as people to take data or use as asset managers and suppliers to give data. Um, and then I'll, I'll update us on our current status. Why I'm looking at that when it's down here on the floor, I don't know. So next steps. So why was the IWG created? Well, I mean, I, I could wax lyrical about this. It's been a, a long 12-year journey for me. And there are some people, unbelievably, who've been doing this for even longer. Um, and there are many people who've come along uh, later in the day. But bluntly, there are really three things. What it really means is that there's been an increasing awareness in recent years that not all costs applied to client assets are either disclosed, easy to understand, or indeed easy to identify or collect. Now, I don't just mean this from the point of view of an institutional investor, I mean it from an asset manager as well. I have empathy um, with the cry which says, sometimes we find it hard to get data because our suppliers downstream haven't supplied it. So it works both ways. But this was picked up on by the Financial Conduct Authority in their Asset Management Market Study last year, and they concluded that institutional investors find it difficult to get the necessary cost information to make effective decision. 
and they proposed a remedy. And the remedy was to create a stakeholder working group with an independent chair, that's me, I am independent, and that is the IDWG, the Institutional Disclosure Working Group, and it, it does start to work after a while, I promise you. Um, if only to remember how to forget it. So objective of this IDWG working group is to gain agreement on disclosure templates for asset man management services that are provided to institutional investors. Um, just reflect on that, it's for the institutional investment community. I get a lot of questions about what about upstream to consumers? Well at the moment we're focusing on the institutional layer, so this is about creating a standard of data that's suitable for asset managers to give and institutional investors to receive uh, and that's pretty much where we are at the moment but it's not just about templates it's about building awareness and understanding so whereas my natural environment is to sit in front of a computer and play with numbers because it's about building awareness and understanding that's why I'm standing here today uh, and so what has migrated from being a, um, a minor topic in a small conference is now a plenary session in a large one so the role is quite important we have to make people aware of the need to collect cost data and to muddle this in with something called value for money um, and to give frameworks for that collection, uh, the collection of that data. So awareness and understanding is very, very important. And the basic principle is this. The mantra of net performance of, uh, is all you need to decide value for money is no longer credible, sustainable, or indeed any way acceptable. So if someone gives you that as an answer, net performance is all you need, please show them the door. So why is the work of the IDWG useful? Well, I can frame this in four ways. First of all, it's good for the institutional investor. It gives you best practice on cost data collection. Um, when I first started looking at this as a subject, trying to understand and diagnose the costs that were applied to client assets through the process of asset management, um, I was asked bluntly, what should we be collecting? And I started putting together frameworks and templates, but it was the same mantra every time. Whenever I spoke to an institutional investor, there was a lack of awareness about what the scope of costs could be. So this work of the IDWG is specifically designed to create a framework that gives you a best practice guide for what you could and should ask for from your, from your asset managers and suppliers. It will help you with your value for money decision making. It's good for the consumer. Bluntly, costs saved are costs are um, is performance earned. A basis point saved is a, is, a, is a basis point earned. But it's also good for the consumer because it builds trust. I was very interested to note in the last panel when we were talking about macro emit risks to the industry that, there, that what wasn't addressed was reputational risk. So we live in an environment in the UK at the moment where I think we can all agree that there aren't enough people saving enough money. We're not hitting the right demographic and we're not saving enough money. So we have to build trust, and transparency is a surrogate for trust. That's another accepted tenant of the industry currently. It's good for the asset management industry, and people often miss this one. It is good for the asset management industry. Why? Because it defines the best standard data, data collection process that asset managers should subscribe to. There are lots of standards out there, lots of confusion. Our job is to try and cut through these and come up with a standard that asset managers can hang their hat on. And the interesting part is that they are. I think when someone comes along and defines something and says this is the standard, people in the light of confusing standards and lots of different standards find it much better to hang their hat on something. There's an efficiency question there. It improves trust at a time when trust is in short supply and it helps identify inefficiencies in the investment supply chain. So because we're looking at the entire supply chain, not just asset management, we're looking at brokers, custodians, consultants, every single provider in that supply chain, it's going to help contract that market and make it more efficient. We're starting to describe what costs are applied at which point in the supply chain. And with that comes the ability to apply technology solutions, the so-called fintech market, of which Edinburgh is quite an interesting place, by the way. They've just started their own hub here in Edinburgh, um, specifically designed to, to work on fintech solutions for the industry. But it's good for the UK. So from the Treasury's point of view, from the FCA's point of view at a macro level, it's supporting and promoting a systemically important sector for the UK. If we can create an environment where the UK has the best um, and most trusted investment environment, not only will we build domestic increase in assets as more people invest more money, um, 
we have a chance of attracting assets in from offshore. And that's got to be a good thing for both the industry and for the UK. Tom Tugendhat has it right. Um, in an article he wrote last year, he said, real investment charge transparency will supercharge the city. Uh, I mean, he's a, a, a Tory MP that sits in Tonbridge, I think it is, but, but he seems to have the zeitgeist quite clearly. So how do we work? Well, the first is we have a clear set of terms, of terms of reference, and these are online. If you look at the FCI web, FCA website and Google Institutional Disclosure Working Group, or just IDWG will do the trick, you come up with our terms of reference. And bluntly, given the fact that cost and fee disclosure is a complex issue, our job is to clarify it along three different dimensions. The first is breadth of coverage and depth of data. How far do we go along investment strategies? Do we just leave it for listed asset managers or should we move into unlisted? And the answer is yes, all of the above. And how detailed should we go? What categories, what fields should we start to think about? Which ones are relevant for the decision-making process that institutional investors have when they're selecting good versus bad or better versus not quite so good? Secondly, different types of institutional investors have different data needs. Bluntly, you could characterize this as DB has one set of requirements and DC has another. And the third part is, given a weight of regulatory, both domestic and international legislation, which sits on the shoulders of both pension funds and asset managers, we need to make sure whatever we come up with is coherent and fits within those hard regulatory standards. Because currently, we're not at a hard regulatory standard point it's entirely likely that people will adopt this anyway without having to put a hard standard in place. Guidance is often all that's needed. So we have some design principles and philosophies that we adhere to in general. The first is a wide range of expertise is needed on the panel. Currently, we have something in the region of 35 members. So I have to chair a group of people being the independent person with two sides of the fence, institutional investors on one side and suppliers to institutional investors on the other. Um, and there are 33 different organizations and points of view represented on it. It's quite a challenge. But what I find really interesting is everyone seems to be pulling together. Now, we're fortunate enough in the room today to have some other members of the IDWG here. So I can see Jeff Houston at the front here from the LGA. I can see Stuart Bevan sitting in the middle there. I know that Ralph Frank is in the audience somewhere. Ralph, pop your hand up. And the reason why I'm asking these people to put their hand up is if you don't get to talk to me and ask me detailed questions, all of the people that you see here are equally aware. I also see Richard Butcher next to Ralph up there. So Richard, sorry, sorry Richard. Are there any other members apart from Richard, Ralph, Jeff, and Stuart in the audience who sit on the IDWG? Yeah, oh, Piers. I'm sorry, <laughs> yeah, Piers. <laughs> Oh, and Joe at the back there, Joe from the PLSA. So we have a number of us in the audience here. Please do avail yourself of their presence because they all know the same things as me. I'm just the mouthpiece. I've been called the mouthpiece many times in my life, often in a derogatory fashion, often on 8-beat, which is the top of the grass market, but that's fine. These guys know what's going on and they can help you with some of their discussions. We're not trying to reinvent the wheel. We're going to adopt and amend as appropriate. The obvious frameworks we're looking here at the LGPS code which Jeff is responsible for, the IA Disclosure Code, which I think Imran is in the audience for, Imran from the IA, formed part of that discussion group, and of course, organizations like ILPA, who provided a very competent and comprehensive way of assessing private equity, albeit it's aimed mainly at, um, at uh, the American market. We're going for low-hanging fruit first. It's easier to understand the way a DB fund is put together than a DC fund. So we've started with DB, but we're migrating towards DC as soon as we can. Listed versus unlisted, I've mentioned. And good data science is important. So I'm a data scientist. I was a cop, PhD in statistics, data scientist. One of the fundamental tenets of data science is always go to source to confirm your data. So we go to a quite a granular level when we dig into this data, because it's only by going to a granular level that we can provenance the data that you will receive at the top. We want the granular data. If we can't get it, we can't agree with the numbers at the top. And things like presentation. We have a design pyramid, and I want to get through this in the next two minutes so we can carry on a debate. But the design pyramid is to go from high granularity, as mentioned, to low granularity via a framework of three different structures. The first is a reference template, of which Ralph is the principal owner. And the reference template is our lexicon of costs. It's some four or 500 lines, I believe, Ralph, uh, of information which describe all of the possible costs 
that you might be able to go down to at the most granular level that impact your suppliers. We don't propose to collect that, but it's very good for understanding where a cost lies. And above that are two frameworks that are relevant for this audience. One is what we call the account template. That's what your suppliers fill out. And then that is summarized into a user template, which is what the institutional investors receive. And the user template is only as good as the data that's populated on the account template. I've put some excerpts from the spreadsheets up there. I want you nothing to, to look at it as nothing more than a complicated set of rows and numbers. We're not ready to release this yet. You can have a look at it if you ask me. That's not a problem. But we have some things we have to sort out. We have to figure out whether the level of data is appropriate. The top two boxes, the box on the right, is a subset of the box on the left. That actual template is huge. And it covers the level of detail which we show on the right. We have to figure out the right level. We have to figure out how granular we can go. And then if you look at the bottom, the multicolored excerpt is to decide which asset classes we can feel good about. Currently, we do have a warm and fuzzy feeling about listed markets, things like equities, fixed income, to a certain extent cash, perhaps foreign, foreign exchange, and then we move towards the right-hand side, which are the unlisted markets, which we still have some work to do. But in terms of the majority of the assets that this audience will be looking at, listed assets, we're pretty much there. In terms of the user template, we have some work to decide what the right summary fields are for a trustee, for an institutional investor. But this is just illustrative. I'm just putting this up here so you know there's some complicated work out there and that we've come a very long way in a short time. As to next steps, I've mentioned the first three. We've got lots of feedback to incorporate. We've had lots of feedback and lots of engagement from asset managers. And I can tell you now it's all been supportive. So, any surprise you might have at that, please don't be surprised. The reason asset managers are engaged is because they recognize that this is an opportunity for them to present themselves as transparent and therefore honest and trustworthy, but also because it's just the right thing to do. And I think there is an understanding in the marketplace that we have to do the right thing ultimately for the consumer. At some point, we'll release the tape stable templates for use, and that won't be too much in the distant future. And at that point, you can take those templates and you can send them to your asset managers. Or as asset managers, you can just proactively say to your suppliers, here's our data. It doesn't matter how it works, as long as there is that communication. We need to work with insurers and DC funds to understand the incremental layers of costs. And we have to consider what the long-term evolution of the standard is, because let's face it, the market changes. So we have a lot to do but we've come a very long way in a very short time. We also have to automate, by the way, and that's another story entirely. Now, I'm gonna leave you here with this slide, but if you have any questions about this and you'd like to find out more, there is the group email box for the Institution Disclosure Working Group and my email. I'm happy to be the one to field the questions, although there is a formal framework for the FCA should you wish to feedback or find out more. Now I'm just going to sit down and field questions. So thank yes, you. Yes, thank you very much, Chris. Um, I, I was told that it would, Chris had so much to say that keeping him to 15 minutes was going to be was going to be difficult, and you can see why. This is an enormous subject, and there's an enormous amount to say. Um, so I mean, in, just in summary, I'd say what, what you were saying was you know, basically I, your, your principles are good for the customer, they're good for trust, good for reputation, good for costs, so good for the industry. Um, Piers, you're in the industry. Um, <laughs> Is, is that how you see it? I mean, what, what is in it for the asset managers? And why I, because you are part of the IDWG, sure, sure, why, yeah. why are you supporting this? I, I, I agree with all of those points. Uh, I think, I, I suspect there are very few in the room here uh, that would disagree that we need to uh, nurture and support a savings culture. Um, I, I think, as you mentioned in your introduction, uh, our reputation was, was tarnished during the global financial crisis. Uh, we were seen as not necessarily putting clients first as, as an industry. Uh, I think the K review pointed to an industry which, which had a, a culture of lack of trust and confidence. Uh, it talked about a misalignment uh, of, of incentives. Uh, it talked about some shortcomings in terms of, uh, of governance. Uh, not, not really a, a particularly attractive backdrop, but I think uh, this work at least goes some way uh, to try and rebuild trust uh, in, uh, in, our, in our industry. And costs matter. 
Uh, there's a very good piece of work on the SEC, which is the, the US regulator's website, which looks at the impact of costs uh, over a, a typical perhaps 20 or 30 year investment period, where even a, a small number of basis points over that sort of period, there's a real compounding effect which, which fundamentally changes outcomes. So I think, I think it's incumbent on us to, to share with investors, prospective investors, what those costs are uh, in order to give them an idea of what is, what is value. Absolutely, and um, we talk thematically about you know about the issues. But what are you what are you actually doing? What what's happening at Bailey Given? What are you doing, peers, to change <laughs> systems? Is it to be more to be presumptuous? Okay, uh, well, I, I sit on the Institutional Disclosure Working Group, and I, I, I know how to say it now. Um, can, can, I, can, I, can, I, can I pick peers <laughs> up here just briefly, right? Because uh, there was a, a moment about four years ago when I wrote a paper for the FCA and the F FSCP, and I was looking for case studies to put in it, and it was about why getting this data is hard. Uh, and, and peers sent me the disclosure that they already had, the disclosure framework that they already had for their clients. And I could map what I was proposing at that point, which what became the LGPS framework. You could map the data that Bailey Gifford was already giving to its clients and had been for some time directly onto that framework, and I hadn't seen that before. So well, I th had thank you. You, get yeah, best yeah, in class. you know, so yeah, exactly. So well, for me, we, that was we, important. We, we have already, and we have been disclosing these costs to, to a certain level uh, to our clients uh, in their quarterly reports over the last uh, ten years or so. Clearly, the markets moved on, and the requirements mm. are, are, are are greater. Um, Chris talked about the LGPS code of transparency. Um, I, I think all credit to Jeff and his colleagues at the LGA. I, I think this has been a real catalyst. Uh, obviously, the, the, the LGPS represents one of the largest buyers in the UK mm -hmm. uh, of fund management services, and they've very much sort of set the standard in terms of what's required from their from their managers uh, in terms of reporting costs. Uh, I, I'm, I'm further very pleased to see that that one of the one of the, the pools. Uh, as many of you will be aware, the LGPS is consolidating uh, into, into eight uh, pools. Uh, one of the pools now, one of the pass-fail questions on, on, as part of their procurement process is, are you signing up to the, to the Code of Transparency? Which is great, because this then has a sort of ripple effect, which pushes this, this much higher standard uh, out, into the, uh, out into the marketplace. I mean, I, <coughs> obviously, this is, it's a business investment management um, and is, is, could this be a dis distinguishing factor between companies, between investment managers, if you, if you are signed up to the code of, uh, the code of standards, if you, if you demonstrate a level of transparency beyond uh, some of the others, will, will, it, will it potentially be a way of winning and attracting business if, if, you, if, if you outshine others? I mean, ultimately, that's, that's, that's the big victory. If, if you can make well, it a business I, case. I, I, think, I, think, I, I, think, I think you're probably right, and I think the example of pools uh, using, using this pass-fail in, in, in as part of a procurement process uh, does, does speak to that. But, but certainly from our perspective, that's not, that's not the main driver. You know, as we touched on, we have been disclosing costs. Many other managers have been disclosing these costs for, for, for a long time. Uh, it, it's more about doing what's right rather than you know, some sort of marketing gimmick. So people have an idea, people have a real understanding as to, as to what your services cost uh, and therefore what they can expect and, 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 and thereby what is, what is good value because clearly cost and value are not, are not, the, same, not the same thing. And Chris, it's, it, there's, there's, there's an issue, of, isn't there, of apples and pears a bit because okay. you're comparing different asset managers, some will be taking I'm gonna greater risks. I'm going mean, to take you back to something simple here, a simple binary thing. We, we've done something for the marketplace just by making people aware of the issue. Yeah. Uh, and Jeff has done it by putting a code of transparency, an actual code, which is a principle you know, it's, not, it's not asking you to do anything else other than be a principal organization and sign up to this code. Uh, and just on that, um, am I allowed to say this, Jeff, about, yeah, okay, they've just had a, the, the Scheme Advisory Board has just had a meeting where they've agreed to uh, migrate the framework they currently use, which is the old LGPS Scheme Advisory Board um, framework, which I wrote four years ago, three years ago, and they've agreed to migrate that when it's ready directly 
to the framework that we have, which is much more complicated, much more insightful, but they're saying this is the one we want to use, mm. and that's a 250 billion pound asset pool that is gonna be pointed at a, this standard straight from the back, you know, from the go. Fantastic. Um, yeah. But, but there's, there's something far, far more fundamental, about, I think, about what we've achieved. And when I say we, I mean everybody here, right? Because you're all part of this. And it's to put in place a simple binary, yes or no, primary question that allows you to filter out good and bad. Now, I'm not a trustee, I've never been a trustee, but I can imagine that you're inundated with information on your suppliers, and you've got uh, consultants and other advisors who are presenting you with a range and plethora of a very complicated information about why you should pick this asset manager or that asset manager during a beauty, beauty parade. Actually, you can put a binary filter in here to get rid of a portion of your asset managers, and that is, are you willing and or able to give this data to this standard? Because if the answer is no, goodbye. Now, as a primary mechanism for differentiating good and bad, that's pretty powerful. I quite like things that provide filters. I love that filtering mechanism on Excel where you can filter out things you don't want to see by asking a simple binary question. Because my personal opinion is, and I think many people would agree with me, is that if someone's unwilling to give data to what is a, an agreed standard, and bear in mind the standard that we are creating is one that is agreed in a consensus fashion by both sides, asset managers and institutional investors. We've, we've created something and written down something that people agree to. And if along comes an asset manager or a supplier, a custodian, a broker, it doesn't matter, who says, no, we're not gonna give data to that level, or, we can't give data to that level, then you, you probably don't want to work with them because they either don't have the systemic capability to collect data that is pretty fundamental or they don't have the honesty with which you should be working. And that, just as a simple primary filter, I can think of nothing better. It cuts out a whole weight of potential suppliers that you can just push to one side and say, well, you go to the back of the list and we prioritize people into ones that will. And I, I think that's quite powerful. Yeah. So it's not necessarily a way of competing to the top. It's basically a way of sorting out the, 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 the good from the, the less good. It's easier to define the negative space than the positive space, right? Absolutely. So I, I'm going to throw it open to the, to the uh, audience now. I, I can get started. There is a question here. Uh, it's quite a technical one. I think as, as a data expert, Chris, it'll probably be more directed towards you. Can the distributed ledger from you know, blockchain uh, serve as a basis for complete transparency and by extension, a mechanism for improving value for money. I mean, it, this is looking into the future. Um, There's one about half a dozen people in the audience who'd ask that. I'm gonna try and figure out which one it is. Um, the answer is distributed ledger technology, DLT, blockchain, which is a, a subset of distributed ledger. Um, so I'm, I'm the professor of financial technology at Leeds University. I work with this technology all the time. The, the word that everybody forgets is distributed consensus ledger. And as long as that word consensus in there, it's, it's part and parcel of distributed ledger. You have to build consensus among all participants within the ledger or within the ledgers. And if you don't, it ain't gonna work. So the hardest part of distributed consensus ledger technology is getting general, general agreement on using it as a technology and agreeing to the terms of reference by which it operates. Should it be public? Should it be private blockchain? There are a whole list of right. selection criteria you would use. So fundamentally, empirically, the answer is yes, it is perfect because you can put all kinds of layers of security and privacy around it. But the chances of it happening depend upon social factors they depend upon consensus. Mm. And it's taken a long time just to get a consensus on just defining a set of data fields, let alone implementing a brand new, brand new, but a completely revolutionary infrastructure to support it. It is absolutely perfect. Trust me, it is absolutely perfect in every way, but it's gonna take a while to get to that level. Uh, just as a point of note, uh, Estonia have, uh, they, they've migrated their citizens onto a distributed ledger blockchain type technology for, for all of their data. Yeah, so I mean, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's happening. It, it, it seems fantastical in a way, but yeah. it is a population of only 1.3 million. It, but and, and, and the fundamental, and, and just on that point, one of the fundamental principles behind distributed ledger is it can provide you with a sure digital identity. Yeah. So if you are operating in a distributed consensus ledger environment with um, a blockchain, a security, a cryptographic protocol around it, you have the ability to identify and be identified as a node in that ledger 
immutably, irre irrevocably, irrevo irrevocably, crikey, I can't say my words properly now, but irrevocably, and it gives you that level of trust that you're working with a counterparty who a third party, let's face it, has, has assessed you as being suitable for, but it provides you with that framework of trust. There is a company in Estonia called Funderbeam, and excuse me for ranting on about this, but I, I know quite a lot about it, Funderbeam, Funderbeam has piggybacked off the Estonian digital identity framework to create a T0, zero, zero incremental cost framework for clearing, settling, updating the share registry for secondary market transactions on unlisted equity. Interesting. It's the I, first one in the world. Amazing. So. We should probably move on. Piers, I bring you in here. Uh, we, not on blockchain. Uh, not no. on blockchain. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll leave you alone on blockchain. Sorry. I've got another question here. What, uh, what do we do about legacy closed-end fund managers where we have uh, portfolios who, where we have portfolios to run off? We can't sack them as easily as you suggest. Um, I mean, I think that's others who are suggesting this, Piers, but... Well, I mean, I, I, gosh, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a difficult question to, 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 uh, to answer. I guess the, the, the point behind that is if you, if you presumably, if you, you've, you've got a runoff book of business and you've got an incumbent manager and the incumbent manager refuses to, to disclose costs, then what do you do? Mm. Uh, well, I, I, it, it, it's difficult to obviously um, comment on individual cases or maybe even generalize. I, I find it hard to believe that... Uh, that, 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 that asset managers, I wish it were perhaps the case, that asset managers had this sort of tenure of, of, of mandates for that length of time without, without any threat. Uh, perhaps, perhaps they do. Uh, I think all fund managers have to, have to do what they're supposed to um, and, and should be doing what they're uh, supposed to in terms of disclosing cost. Um. <laughs> Chris, yeah. are you I, I just, you know, I think if I got the question right, is how do you get rid of an asset yeah. manager that's not not providing you with the data? Yes, so I think probably the asset managers. Of, yeah. yeah, I think the asset manager is more worried about money it won't be able to raise in the future off the back of a reputation for being intransigent over there. So this is a reputational risk is is a is a genuine risk. Huge. It's a genuine business risk, Huge. and, 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 and people and should bear that in mind. Is, yeah good reputational risk, where you've done yeah. well, should be rewarded. And that's why people are putting in RFPs right now, please sign up to the local government uh, pension scheme advisory board code of disclosure, whether or not they're serving uh, a pool of constituents who are local government pension schemes. Because the only game in town currently is that code of disclosure, mm. and people are seeing it as a cachet. They can market themselves on it. You, you mentioned uh, dra draft templates in your, in your slides, uh, which someone is asking, can, they want the slides to be made publicly available so they can have a proper perusal. Mm -hmm. but, um, uh, Come and see me, please. <laughs> Just have a word so, and I'll, I'll make you, uh, you can Yeah, see I think it. you put your email up, so yeah. obviously. Um, uh, can you tell us when the near future is? So this, this idea that this will all be available in the near future. So how, how, how quick can you work? And Piers, I suppose you can jump in and just, how quick can the industry adopt uh, th this stuff? Um, I think I think you know reasonably quickly. If you if you look at the the number of managers that have signed up to the LGPS uh, code of transparency, I, th I think it's now up to thirty odd managers, which cover sixty seventy percent of the of the assets managed by the by the LGPS. We we were very proud to be one of the first signatories to that to that code, uh, and that requires managers to be providing. Uh, data from the end of this uh, this uh, financial year, so March uh, March 31st. So it, it's not it, it's it's not impossible for people to to embrace this. It's obviously not just the LGPS. There are requirements coming from PRIPS, requirements coming from MIFID. There, there, there are a number of different sort of regulatory strands which are all sort of pointing in the same direction and looking for similar sort of, sort of data. So, uh, you know, as an asset manager, we've been working on this, as, as many have, for, for a number of years to be in a position to be able to deliver this uh, in, in pretty short order. And Chris, do you have... Do you have a date? Could you say when you would be able to produce it? Um, we started with a whole scale lack of acceptance of wanting to do anything other than from the members of the IDWG in November last year. And we've already reached a point where we have a good consensus on the majority of it. It's moved far quicker than I ever expected. Yeah, because you're very I, young. Right? I don't yeah. understand. Yeah, I don't. So the institution. <laughs> I'm very young. Yeah, I was well, going to be flattered well. there for a moment. No, no. <laughs> but we are as a group very young. We've come a very long way in a very, a very short amount of time. And that's because there's will. So long as that will is maintained, we can progress. And the will is there. I mean, it's been 
quite liberating, actually, to have people pulling in the same direction for once. Um, it just appears to be you know, the right time to do the right thing. So you want a date? If I would like to have something substantial released by uh, March the 31st, or uh, no, it's by the beginning of April, the reason being is that's the start of the new financial year. And I'd like people to start thinking about the kind of data they should be collecting for the next financial year. I, I do think it's worth saying that you know, there are some implementation issues. Yeah. One, one of the things that we are being required to do uh, now is look at, look at market impact. So every time you, you buy or sell a security, you will have an impact, particularly if you're an institutional investor, you will have an impact on the, on the market price. And, and we are being required to, to capture that, which requires us to, to look at the point at which we, we execute a trade at what the spread, what the bid offer spread is at the market, then compare our, our execution price with the mid price at the time that we, that we dealt. So there's, there's quite a lot of data there, and yeah. the, there's, there's quite a lot of data going back for a long period of time, and in some asset classes that's really quite difficult to get. Obviously from here going forward it becomes easier. So, so one of our concerns is some of these numbers that are coming out do look not, you know, when you get negative numbers that you've actually made a profit out of dealing in, out of market impact, that makes me slightly nervous. But I think, I think this will wash out. There are other implementation issues, but I think we, really, we shouldn't let these derail the overall uh, move towards transparency. We're, we're, we're out of time, but I'll just do, I'll have got one more question here. Yeah. Um, is, is there a relationship, it sounds like the suggestion here is that people are trying to, are gaming the system a little bit. Is there a relationship between the willingness of a manager to provide the data for evaluation of charges and the historic performance? So I guess the charge looks better if your historic performance has been, your recent historic performance has been better. Um, I'm not sure I understand the question. I'm not actually. sure, I, I think, Charges are obviously if you perform better than your, you your then, then better the size of the, for money, then the size of the assets is, is, is bigger. But your 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 costs are are your costs, however ba well or badly you're you're performing. So I'm I'm not sure I I agree there is that correlation. I think we need to differentiate here between costs that are incurred directly by an asset manager and contingent costs that are incurred by the business model operated by the asset manager. So so the bit that we've always had. A lack of transparency on is all of these contingent costs. You know, bluntly, now it'll be all the slippage costs that MIFID are bringing out because that's all the contingent costs. In the hedge fund world, it's cost of carry, right? These can be some considerable costs, and your model can seriously impact those costs. Um, I don't get the sense that anyone's going to be gaming anything. I don't think any of that data that we're asking for is in any way hard to collect. There isn't a single asset manager out there that couldn't get the data. Um, from their systems if they put a bit of effort into it. And that's why I think this works. In, in, in the light of a lack of clear guidance on what is appropriate and what is not appropriate, we are providing that guidance. And therefore, it's almost with a sense of relief that I see asset managers go, finally, someone's told us what it is that we should be collecting. Mm. Now we just have to code it into our systems and that's just a systemic issue. Um, there will be concerns about other suppliers in the value chain not giving their data, but we'll cross that hurdle when we come to it. Mm. Just giving that single opinion, which is, this is what you should reasonably be expected to give, and the community has gone, thank you. Well, it looks like progress is, it's all moving, everything's moving very fast. Um, yeah. from, from the sounds of things. So thanks, thanks very much to uh, the panellists, Chris and Piers. Um, can I ask you to rate, a, uh, rate the panel using the conference app? Um, so if you liked it, do uh, give it a thumbs up. Um, and uh, so, so that's it for the day. Don't want to keep you from the pub and the drinks receptions for any longer. But uh, to, tomorrow it all starts again at 9.15 uh, with a plenary session on benefiting from the wages of sin. So that, that sounds exciting way to start the day. And there will be Dan Snow talking about the sort of prehistory of Brexit as well. So um, uh, it should be a good day. Thanks very much. I like the idea that some